Now, chapter 5 of 2 Kings is the famous account of Naaman. And all Sunday school teachers teach their kids the story of Naaman. You know, seven, seven ducks in the dirty river. And it's a great story. And of course, the, the, uh, the servants of Naaman, who was the captain or the, the general of the army uh, of the army of Syria, uh, played a big part in that story. And so keep that in mind, the context there. Now, we're not exactly sure of the time span between chapter 5 and chapter 6 here of uh, 2 Kings, but it gives us a little bit of context of where we're going this morning. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. And let's ask for God's blessing this morning on the message. Heavenly Father, thank you for the beautiful autumn day, and we thank you, Father, for the songs of praise that uh, we, we sing uh, to you this morning. And dear Lord, behold our God, we, we worship and praise and honour you this morning. I pray now as we look at your word, dear Lord, I pray that you'll speak to every heart, uh, including mine, and may the word of God come alive to us this morning. And as always, we pray for the work of the Spirit of God through his filling, his anointing upon the mess messenger and upon those who listen this morning. And all praise and glory, dear Lord, we, we know will go to you for answering this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever witnessed a car accident? I'm sure you have. We've all seen car accidents of varying descriptions. And uh, you, may have, you may have been on, a, um, <clears throat> on, on, on an intersection. And in the aftermath of that car accident, you're giving your re report to, um, to Tony, maybe, or one of the policemen there. And, 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 and you're saying, well, the car came from my right and, and went through the, uh, the stop sign and hit the car coming up this way. And someone else says, no, hang on, no. the car came from my left and hit the car coming this way, hit them, and that was the accident. Well, well, who's right there? Well, well, you're both right. It's just that you're looking at something from uh, differing perspectives. Here is the account here from 2 Kings chapter 6. The king of Syria decided to up his warring against the king of Israel. And so he decided to camp in such and such a place. And he said, what we're going to do here is we're going to ambush the, uh, the king of Israel as he comes along. And so the ambush was all set. And uh, the man of God, Elisha, uh, sent to the king of Israel and said, listen, the king of Syria is down there, so don't go that way. And then this happened. Uh, on numerous occasions. Every time the king of Syria uh, got, his, um, 
uh, his, his, uh, his soldiers ready to ambush the king of uh, Israel and, and when he was traveling and so on, uh, um, he never turned up. And so here's the king of Syria looking, looking waiting for the king of uh, Israel to come. He just never turned up. And he was getting frustrated. He was actually getting ticked off. And, and he said, all right, I'll tell you what, this is, this is not good. So <clears throat> I think what's happening, there's, there's a spy in our midst. <clears throat> so he got his servants together and his generals and his, so on. And he said, listen, one of you is a spy. One of you is, is working for Israel. And I'm going to find out who it is. Now, one of the servants, one of his servants, stands up and says, uh, <clears throat> Mr. King, well, he most probably didn't say Mr. King, but whatever he would have said in Syria, O King, uh, <clears throat> O Great One, he said, uh, and, and I wonder, I'm only guessing this, but I wonder, was this particular servant, uh, previous to this, a servant of Naaman? I don't know, it could have been. But any, in any case, the servant, he, he said, uh, uh, <clears throat> O King, uh, there's no spy here. But I'll tell you what's happening. That preacher fella, that prophet fella, Elisha, from Israel, he is the one that's doing it. In fact, you know, he even knows what you're thinking in your bedroom. Because his God is telling him these things. And so the king of Syria thought, well, that's the way it is. We need to spy on him. We need to find out where he lives. And then we're going to go and get it. We're going to do a hit on the man of God. And so that's what they did. They found out that Elisha was living in a, in a city, which was just a little place, most probably, a place called Dothan, but it had walls around it. And so he said, what we're going to do, we're going to sneak up there at night, we're going to get our heavy hitters, we're going to get our commandos and our, our best warriors and our horses and our chariots and so on, we're going to sneak up and then we're going to assassinate Elisha. Well, this happened at night time, Early the next morning, Elisha, Elisha's servant, got up early. And out he goes. I don't know what he was doing. He was going down to get a coffee for Elisha, maybe, or, or get the newspaper. I don't know, whatever they did in, in, in Dothan in those days. Maybe going down to Macca's, get a bacon. Well, he wouldn't have been a bacon and egg, would it? A sausage and, sausage and egg or something. And, uh, uh, and he looked up, and it was just getting light. He looked up, and all he can see is the city is surrounded by the Syrian heavy artillery, surrounded. And that's where we get to the account here. We, we've just read through this, obviously. His servant went, verse 15, his servant said unto him, unto Elisha, Alas, my master, how shall we do? How shall we do? And then Elisha said to him, he answered, verse 16, Fear not. Fear not. Elisha, let me say something here. Elisha's servant was afraid of his surroundings. He was petrified. And most probably if you or I had been there, we would have been petrified too. Seeing all this, uh, the, 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 the heavy hitters of the Syrian army surrounding this little city of Dothan. You know, a lot of Christians are afraid today. And we're not supposed to be afraid. You know, the Bible says, don't, don't, don't uh, look it up. I'll read you the verse from 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We've just had an election. And as much as we try and avoid advertising, you, you can't help but get bombarded by advertising from all sides of politics. And the advertising in any election is based on one thing. It's based on fear. It's based on fear. It's not based on, this is what I can do for you. No, this is what's going to happen if you don't vote for me. It's fear. Whether it's fear of change or fear of, of uh, uh, the climate or, or, or fear of taxes or fear of whatever. You know, as Christians, we're not supposed to live in fear. That's not, that's not how it works. We're not, not to live in fear. Time and time and time again, the Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples, what did he say? Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. It's easy for us to be fearful. Well, Elisha asked God and said, Lord, could you open the eyes of this young man? 
In fact, verse, verse 16 again, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And I can just imagine this young fellow thinking, what? There's two of us and there's a whole battalion of them. How are we more than them? And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, open his eyes. Open his eyes. And that's exactly what happened. The young man, the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, verse 17, and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. God opened in a miraculous way the eyes of this servant and he looked up and he, and he raised his eyes. He looked up and he could see that behind the Syrians, the sky was just full of angelic beings, chariots, horses of fire, angels sent by God. Uh, does that normally happen? No, it doesn't normally happen, but in this instance it did. Now let me make a couple of um, applications here this morning. I want to say, first of all, the unsaved have a blinded perspective. The unsaved have a blinded perspective. You say, can you prove that? Yes, yeah, 2 Corinthians 4, in whom the God, small g, God of this world, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So listen, don't be too hard on unsaved people that are terrified. And there's many, many Aussies out there in Sydney today that are terrified, terrified of life itself. But don't be too hard on them because their eyes, their spiritual vision is blinded by Satan. But to be effective servants of God, you know what we need to do? We need to open our eyes and look up. We need to make sure that we have the right perspective on life. You know, we can go through life and, and if we just focus on the Syrians, we're all surrounded by Syrians of some description. It might be sickness, it might be debt, it might be, um, it might be an emotional problem, it might be a family problem, it might be a marriage problem, it might be, could be anything. And we've all, we all have our problems. We all have our Syrians. And if all we can see in life is, is our Syrians, yeah, we will be fearful. We will be fearful. But you know, for the child of God, you know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to open our eyes and look up. We have to make sure that we have the right perspective on life. And I think it does as well to be reminded of this. We need to open our eyes and look up and realize, hey, there is a God. There is a God. We need to make sure that we have, first of all, the right perspective on God. We sang about him this morning. Who is the Lord? If you've got your Bible there, Psalm 8 verse 1. Keep a bookmark there in 2 Kings chapter 6. Psalm 8 and verse 1. We need to make sure that we have a right perspective on God. This is what the psalmist said, Psalm 8, 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. In all the earth. God's name is excellent in the earth. I think this illustration fits. I'll tell, I'll tell you the story anyway. But in Coffs Harbour, we have a mortgage on Australia's noisiest bird. We do. And now I'm an, I'm an early riser. I'm normally waking up about half, half four or five. But <clears throat> there's always um, kookaburras outside my window. I don't know what they're doing. They just come, uh, they're most probably down on the street, on the power line, but they seem to, I don't know, they aim at my window. And they're, la they're most probably laughing at me. Yeah, I understand. But they're going off their heads. And then the kookaburras finish, and then the rainbow lorikeets start. When it's starting to get light, the rainbow, we have a mortgage on the rainbow lorikeets of Australia, millions of them. And again, I call them the delinquents of the, of the bird family. But they're just out there, and they're loud. And then we have the storm bird. If it's raining, well, it's always raining in Coffs Harbour, so there's always a storm bird there. And then there's the, all these other birds, and they're all going off their heads right outside my window. I have a theory about these birds. Now, I'm not Dr. Doolittle, but I have a theory that these little birds are praising the Lord. That's what I think. I can't speak birds. But I reckon they're praising the Lord in their own little voices. Oh Lord, our, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. 
That's what I'm going to think anyway, even if I'm not God. But you look at the creation of God in these little animals. Wow. What a God. And then, and then the psalmist said, Psalm 8, look at verse number 3. He said, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. Not only is God's name great in all the earth, God's name is great in the heavens. How can you not, I mean, I know it's Sydney, there's not, can't see a lot of stars up there, but if you ever get the chance to go west, and I mean way out west, get away from the light pollution, if you're a Christian, you cannot but help look up at the stars and be amazed. Every time you do it. I don't care how many times you can, you know, put a, put a little mat down at, in the night time, just lie down, lie down, look up at the stars and be amazed. And just wonder at the glory of God. You know, uh, 19, in 1977, there were two spacecraft were sent out from planet Earth. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Some of you would remember those events. You know those little spacecraft, they're still going today. What's that? Almost 45 years later. This, they've actually gone past Pluto and they're out into space doing their thing, sending back data and so on. 45, they weren't supposed to last this long, but they're still going. And actually, you can, there's, a, there's a website. It's really interesting to go to this website. It gives you actual real-time information on, on the Voyager uh, vessel, there's two of them, these spacecraft, and it tells you how fast they're going and how far away they are. From, from memory, the last time I looked, they're, they, they're doing about 60,000 kilometres an hour. But I did a little bit of research on these, these Voyager spacecraft. You know, the, the, next, uh, <clears throat> the next star to us here, our little cluster of heavenly bodies here, is called Proxima Centauri, and it's 4.2 light years away. Now, there might be some um, uh, really fancy scientific type people here, and you can correct me later if I'm wrong, but I think I'm sort of, I'm sort of roughly correct here. These, uh, the next star is 4.2 light years away, and light travels 186,000 miles per second, or 300,000 kilometres per second, and so light travels 9.7 trillion kilometres a year. That's a long way. Now, at the present speed of Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, have a guess how long it will take to reach Proxima Centauri. It'll take 77,000 And that's just the next star to us. That's, the, that's our nearest neighbour, 77,000 years. And if that um, uh, little, those little, the little uh, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, if they were to keep going and to cross the entire Milky Way galaxy, at the current speed would take 1.7 billion years. And that's just our galaxy. And they estimate there are hundreds of billions of galaxies. So you look up there at the stars and you think, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Sometimes, you know, you, you can focus on the Syrians, you can focus on the problems, you can focus on your enemies, but sometimes you just need to look up and think, there's a God. There's a creator God. And he is so much bigger than us. He is so much higher than us. Yes, we can't understand all the ways of God. We're not supposed to. He is God. And the psalmist went on to say there, verse number four, this is the crowning achievement of God's creation. He says, what is man? that thou art mindful of him. You think the stars, you think the universe is great. Just think about man, you and me. God's crowning, God's crowning glory of his creation is man. When I say man, I mean men and women. I have a, uh, an acquaintance in Adelaide. His name is Dr. Anthony Pohl, P-O-H-L. And I haven't seen Anthony for... 10 or 12 years now. But um, the last time I saw him was uh, I was in Adelaide preaching and he was at that time at the church I was preaching at and I had my son David with me and David and I went to his house uh, for dinner one night that week and we talked about um, a lot of things. But he shared me a story. Now Dr. Pohl is an orthopedic surgeon and I don't know whether he's still practicing, I'm not sure. But he's a world-renowned orthopedic surgeon. 
and he was the professor of anatomy at Adelaide University and very well respected in his field. He said, you know what we've done? And by the way, Bible-believing creation. He said, we have, um, uh, we've isolated a protein. And he says, we get this protein and we inject it into the wound site you know, for uh, knee replacements and hip replacements and so on. And it speeds up the healing process. He said, this protein is made up of 43 amino acids. Now, I don't know what an amino acid is. It's a little thing. But whatever these little amino acids are, again, if there's any chemist type people out there, you can fill me in later what an amino acid is. But there's 43 of these little fellas, and they're all in the line, and they, they form a protein, a very simple, basic protein. But those 43 amino acids have to be in the exact order for this protein to be this protein. Dr. Pohl asked a mathematician friend of his to quote the probability that those 43 amino acids could form by random, by, by chance. This is a very simple little protein. So ch -ch 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 -ch, he's work on his computer. He said the chances of that happening are 1 in 10 to the 80th power. That's 10 with 80 zeros. In other words, it's impossible that, that this little, tiny little 43 amino acid string protein could form by chance. Impossible. Cannot happen. You know how complicated the DNA of man is? Now, I do know that DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. I don't know what it is. I just memorized that big word many years ago to sort of try and, try and sound edumacated. Edu you know how complicated the DNA of man is? It is astonishingly complicated. And if any parts of those DNA are, 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 are not in the right order, like the hair DNA, mine's, mine's lost. I don't know what happened to it. And there's a lot of fellas here. We got the same DNA. I don't know what happened. The hair DNA, it just, you know. I have the dad joke, the dad joke DNA. That, re that replaced the hair DNA. Because I think my dad jokes are really good. But anyway. <laughs> but you know, the possibility, of, uh, the probability of the DNA of man just happening by chance, it, it's, it's ridiculous. That's why evolution is the greatest fairy story ever told. It is ridiculous. But we look at man... We look at the creation of God and we just wonder, what is man that thou art mindful of him? We need to get the right perspective on God. You know, we, we, we can keep our view down, keep our eyes down, and all we can see is our problems. And we all get like this sometimes. That's my problem, that's my problem, that's my problem. We're fenced in by the Syrians. I'm here to tell you this morning, if you are a believer, if you are part of the family of God, if you've been born again by, by faith in Jesus Christ, based on what he did on the cross, his shed blood, his resurrection. If you are a child of God, but as many as received him, to them gave he power or authority or right to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. Hey, we have a, we have a heavenly father that is incredible. And just sometimes, in fact, not just sometimes, but all the times, we, we need to get our eyes off the Syrians and lift up our eyes and say, there's a God there. There's a God there. We need to get the right perspective on God. We need to make sure we have the right perspective on life after death. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that we sorrow not as others who have no hope. That's not Christians. That's not God's children. We do not sorrow. Yes, we sorrow when someone passes on. Uh, yes, we, we, it, we, we are humans. We grieve. But we don't sorrow as those that have no hope. I might have shared this story with you before, but it was October last year. A very dear friend of mine from Coffs Harbour passed away. His name was Gordon Forrester. And Gordon was 89. And he, when it came to health problems, he had more health problems than you could poke a stick at, they say. He was had it. And you know, for year after year, I would, I would, I would go and visit Gordon. Mentally, sharp as a tack, but physically he just, his body was had it. And I'd go and we'd, I'd have fellowship with Gordon and we'd bring up some prayer, requ prayer requests and, 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 and Gordon would he'd sit there 
in his rocking chair, weeping, saying, praise me, say, why doesn't God take me to heaven? I don't want to be here anymore. A couple of years ago, he was in the doctor's surgery in Coast Harbour for a checkup with his GP, and he had this massive heart attack out in the waiting room. So, you know, the doctor comes running out and pumps the chest, you know, and, they, and they finally they bring him back. He comes to, looks up, sees his GP, and this is what he said. He said, don't you ever do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. He was so disappointed. He said, I just want to go to heaven to be with the Lord. I don't want to be here anymore. He said, how can someone think like that? We, don't, we sorrow not as others which have no hope. You see, we have a different perspective on life after death. You say, is death a great thing? Death's a terrible thing. The wages of sin is death. But the Bible says that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And the world cannot, un they're blinded to that. They cannot understand that. We need to get the right perspective on so many things. I've got things written down. We don't have time to go through them on money and family and marriage and so on. We need, we, need, we need to have the right perspective on the return of Christ in the last days. Paul said to Timothy, you know, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, disobedient, ungodly, unthankful, and, and, and on the list goes. Second Timothy chapter 3, read it sometime. So we are not surprised at what is happening in the world today. Say, wow, isn't that a, isn't a terrible what's happening? No, no, we, we, the Bible tells us this is going to happen. We're not surprised at all. Because we have the right perspective on the return of Christ. We know that one day the trumpet's going to sound. At the last trump, the trumpet shall sound. The dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. That's the next event in God's prophetic timetable, this thing called the rapture. Yeah, I know, the rap word rapture's not in the Bible. That word is not in the Bible, understand it. But the event is going to take place. Just read your Bible. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Be ready. We understand what's happening in the world. We understand all that. We expect that to happen. And then, lastly this morning, we need to have the right perspective on the lost. The right perspective on the lost. You know, Jesus was... Jesus was, uh, you know the story in John chapter 4, he was, uh, he said, I must needs go through Samaria. The disciples said, what? Samaria? That's like us going to Queensland. There's Queenslanders up there. I must needs, I must needs go to Samaria. Samaria? There's Samaritans there. The Lord said, yeah, I've got to go there. We need to go there. So off we go. Went. Here's the lady at the well. Lady at the well, you know the story. And uh, the disciples were amazed. You're talking to this lady at the well. Yep. I told her about the water that I give. Incredible water. If you drink the water that I give, you'll never thirst. I said to the lady, go and, go and call your husband. Oh, I haven't got a husband. Thou hast well said, because you've had five husbands. And the fellow you're with now, that's not your husband. Went back to the people of the Samaritan family and friends said, Come see a man that told me everything about me. And many believed on Christ because of her word. And then many came, and remember, Jesus was there for a couple of days. And many believed because they went and heard him themselves. But what did Jesus say later in that chapter to his disciples? He said, Don't say there's four months till the harvest. He said, Lift up your eyes. Look out here. Look out where? On all the Samaritans. Just tell us, that's your harvest. That's your harvest. The harvest is ready. Samaritans? Yeah. They need the Lord. They need the Lord. So what am I supposed to do in these last days? Everything's, everything's going bad. The world's just, just gone crazy. Yeah, it has. But the Lord's coming back. And we need to lift up our eyes to the harvest. 
You know what we need? We need some we need some gospel visionaries. I was going through my prayer list just this morning. I redo my prayer list every three months. So I have, you know, summer, autumn, winter, spring. And there's hundreds and hundreds of names on my prayer list. I, I was going through my prayer list and I, I have all different categories, people that I pray for. And of course, the cat, there's a category of the pastors, Australian pastors, New Zealand pastors, and then missionaries and so on. I went through my prayer list this morning and I rubbed out, when it comes to missionaries and pastors, I rubbed out 15 names this morning. Pastors and missionaries that are no longer in the field compared to just a short while ago. 15 names gone. 15. Uh, you know what we need? We need some Australian Christians born again bible believing christians called of god equipped ready trained to lift up their eyes say so, yep yeah, i can see the harvest there the lord's coming back any moment the trumpet's going to sound but there's a harvest out there there's a harvest out there I, 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 i'm going to spend whatever time we have left here i'm going to spend my time in reaching the lost now, it may not be on the mission field. It may just be working for whoever you work for. Maybe just doing what you do. But lifting your eyes up and seeing, yeah, that's the harvest. Folks, we need to get busy about the Lord's work. The Lord is coming back. Jesus said the night comes when no man can work. And when Jesus comes back, the opportunity to influence others with the gospel, to win others to Christ, to play our, pay up play our part in fulfilling the Great Commission. That's gone then. It's still daytime. It's getting dark, but it's still daytime. We can still work. And it's the job of every Christian. So what's well, the job of the pastor? Yes, it is. But it's the job of every Christian to be a soul winner, to be a gospel preacher. Not from up here behind the pulpit, but from wherever you are, a broadcaster of the seed of the gospel. That's our job. I'm just asking someone today just to lift up your eyes and just see that the harvest is ready, it's ready to be picked. Maybe, maybe somewhere around here there's a gospel visionary. Maybe there's a gospel visionary. If I turn this thing off, is this still working? I think it's still working. Maybe there's someone who's going to lift up their eyes and say, yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to replace one of those missionaries. I'm going to replace one of those pastors who's no longer in the ministry and actually do something about it. Maybe God's going to speak to someone. Maybe God is speaking to someone. And maybe you've come this morning and you just needed to have your perspective adjusted a bit. We need to get our eyes off the Syrians. Yep, they're all, we're always going to be surrounded by Syrians. That's life. That's life. We're always surrounded by enemies. We're surrounded by obstacles. We're surrounded by trials and tribulations. That, that, that's life being a human being on planet Earth. I'm just saying this morning, just lift up your eyes and look up. There is a God in heaven. He's a wonderful God. He's an incredible God. He has a plan for each one of us. And if you are not a Christian this morning, you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour. If there never was a time, <clears throat> there never was a time when you ask Christ into your life by faith. You know, it may be this morning that God, through the work of His Spirit, is taking away that blindness from your eyes. Maybe you see your need. I just ask you to come and be safe today. Let's have all heads bowed and eyes closed, please. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask him to come and close off the meeting. But while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, is there someone here this morning, and you would say in your heart of hearts, Preacher, I didn't understand most of the sermon today, but I do understand that I'm a sinner and that I'm not saved, that I'm not a born-again, Bible-believing Christian. I don't know that there was a time 
when I received Christ into my heart by faith, that I would like to become a Christian today. Hey, I'd like to give you the opportunity to respond to the message. And this is how I'd like you to do it. Right where you are, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you just put your hand up in the air so I can pray for you? Is there one person you'd say, preacher, I don't know that I'm a Christian. I'm not sure. But I would like to know more about becoming a Bible-believing, born-again Christian. Just put your hand up in the air. Put it down again. I'm not going to call your name out. I most probably don't even know your name. There one. Preacher, that's, I don't know. I'm not sure. Put that hand up. And I'll include you in my closing prayer. Thank you, Father, for the word of God. I pray, dear Lord, that this morning you will have encouraged some Christian, maybe a Christian who is really fearful. Father, we, we're not supposed to live in fear. We all get fearful at times, but Lord, we're not supposed to. We know that. That's, you've said that in your I pray that you'd encourage that believer to lift their eyes up, focus on you. Bless the closing song this morning. We pray in Jesus' name.